It's time to relive great moments with former Cowboys. Eddie something with the all-time great. You know, that's one of the great things in uh, having the, the opportunity to coach here in Oklahoma State was the fact that you had such great people. It's time for Where Are They Now on Triple Play Sports Radio. John Farrell, former Cowboy pitcher back in the early 80s. And, and you know what, mostly putting up with me, I guess, after you know, chasing everybody around, chasing us around the country. Where Are They Now? Our weekly talk with former Oklahoma State athletic coaches, players, and personnel. Desmond Mason, former All-American player here at Oklahoma State. You know, so today, that's what I spend most of my days doing. For the most part, is you know, in the studio trying to paint and trying to create. And, um, I enjoy doing that. It's like catching up with an old friend every Wednesday. Boy, do I feel old today, as I always do on a Wednesday when we bring back some of these uh, former athletes. Uh, we're talking with Houston up. Sure did. Had a great time. That was a, of course, my mom and dad went to school there. My brother, Dick Houston, you mentioned, went to school there. And, uh, of course, we both met our, our wives right there in Stillwater, Oklahoma. Now your host, ready to take a stroll down memory lane, here is Tom Dorado. Well, thank you very much, and welcome once again to another edition of Where Are They Now? And uh, we know where this guy is because we've had him on the air several times. The guy being the man we've been previewing, Melvin Gillum, former two-start standout here at Oklahoma State. And uh, and I mentioned, Melvin, the object of a fierce recruiting battle with the University of Oklahoma, but we won that one out. Uh, but nonetheless, going back, and I digress <laughs> a little bit, uh, First of all, how you doing? Catch us up on what you've been doing since we talked to you last. Well, doing the same old thing, still doing the banking thing, you know, doing banking at Spear Bank here in Tulsa. Everything is going pretty good, man. I can't complain at all. Well, if you did, nobody would listen to you anyway. So exactly. Good. Nobody cares. <laughs> nothing's, <laughs> nothing's changed, Melvin, since you were here, especially of me. Course. I wouldn't care, but I'd listen nonetheless. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's important now. At least someone will listen. Hey, on yeah. a serious note, one of the things that we I wanted to talk to you about, and uh, I kind of previewed this as well, uh, you along with several great players out of Booker T. Washington played for an iconic coach in basketball in Nate, Nate Harris, and he passed, unfortunately, a couple of weeks ago, I guess. Uh, and there was a lot written about his uh, services and all. But what was it like being around an icon like Nate Harris? Well, I'll tell you, man, uh, just a great guy. A lot of people talk about him being this iconic of a coach. He was an iconic person. He was just a good person. A lot of people say, you know, all of his athletes, how they come back and support him. But he knew all the students, too. A lot of people don't realize you walk down the hall and you're just a regular student. You could have been in the band and he knew your name. Hmm. I mean, he was just that kind of guy. Kids just were drawn to him, you know. Just a, just a good guy all around. I mean, when people say we really lost an iconic individual, we really did. We really did. You know, you find out uh, at times like this when when testimonials are given and stories are written and, and former players uh, kind of open up about a man like uh, Nate Harris – that, that tells you all you need to know about how much that man meant to you guys all these years later. Oh, man, I'll tell you. He's in the same boat with Eddie Sutton. You know how Eddie Sutton's players were just bonkers over him. Mm -hmm. Coach Harris was the exact same way. I mean, I think of all of the All-Americans he coached. I think of all of the careers that he got started. You know, he was one of the main reasons I played both sports at Oklahoma State. Because we were going through the recruiting process, and I said, man, I don't know if I want to play football or basketball. He said, why don't you play both? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, you got a point. Why not play both? And, and the rest is history, you know? So, um, I mean, he was just that kind of person, man. And I, and I remember when his kids were born. I can go all the way back to high school when I was in high school and Wayman Tisdale was in college. And it was a known, it was an understanding that once you went off to college, you came back to help the guys that were in high school. Mm -hmm. So when they graduated, as you know, colleges got out of school before high school. So they would come back and they would play basketball with us. And they would wonder why we would win every year. Heck, we're playing against guys like Wayman Tisdale, Chris on Hay. We're playing against guys that were going to the NBA every day in the summer. So playing against other high school kids was a party compared to playing against those guys. So 
it was a reason, and he had a system, and he had he taught basketball, which is a lost art these days. I think. I mean, guys, even guys in the NBA, their basketball IQ doesn't look very high by the way they play. <laughs> I mean, I'm like, why did you? I mean, you just watched the 76ers game the other day when Kawhi Leonard hit that game winning shot. Everybody in the gym knew who was going to shoot that ball. Mm -hmm. And they don't double them. (laughs) I don't understand that. Sometimes you got to let your basketball IQ take over and go play basketball. He shot 39 times that night. Who do you think is going to shoot it? (laughs) A 40th time, probably. Yeah, yeah. Double the guy, you know? So, you know, it's just things like that. I can tell basketball IQs is just not what it was from back in the day, you know. What was – but was Coach Harris tough on you? I mean, on – Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. Let me tell you the way he cut my sophomore year. Two-line layup. Everybody can't dunk, go to the other end. Three-man weed. Everybody can't dunk, go to the other end. We had 15 guys left. Okay, you guys are the team. You you guys are varsity. Wow. And he says, I want you guys to understand something. If you get a fast break and you do not dunk it, you are coming out. I don't care if you miss, but I need you to dunk it. I need you to try to dunk it. And I'm telling myself, what kind of coach is this? How in the world do you pick a team by guys that can just dunk? <laughs> but Coach Harris had a method to his madness. And he taught all of us basketball. And I would be amazed. I mean, you would be amazed the things today that he taught us that we still remember. I mean, that was my edge when I was in college. I was used to playing against such good players. Coming to Oklahoma State, playing against good players was what I was used to. So it was it was just normal. It was just normal for us. But when I tell you the guy had some odd ways. And then you go back and look at him, and you don't realize till you're done what he was trying to teach you. You know, you sound a lot like, uh, and, and you do the comparison, to Eddie Sutton. You sound a lot like the former players under Eddie Sutton who say the same thing. You know, at the time you probably uh, were were not feeling warm and fuzzy about the guy because he was making you do this and that. And as a youngster, you probably thought you knew everything. But at the end, and now all these year, years later, you saw the importance of what he was teaching. And I'll tell you where it's really funny. When you go back and help coach some kids, you find yourself <laughs> doing the exact same things that they did. <laughs> so you know what those kids are saying. They're saying the same thing you said. What is this guy doing? What is he thinking about? And you tell them, trust me, guys. Later, you'll get it. Just trust me. <laughs> You know, so I'm, that's su- exactly right. I'm surprised that you didn't. I mean, you tried the pro ranks uh, in football, and you, mm-hmm. and, but I'm surprised that you did not go into coaching on a full time basis because you you brought that knowledge of both sports, really. But I'm we're talking more basketball here right now. Mm-hmm. That you that yeah. you didn't go in and make that a full time calling. Well, I I really thought about it. I tell you, Tom, I I thought about it, and let me tell you what made me change my mind. I I remember what kind of weird 18-year-old I was. (laughs) And I said, I don't know if I could stake my living on a weirdo like myself. (laughs) (laughs) So I think I'll go get me a degree and I'll go ahead and get in the business. That's exactly why I didn't. Now, I do go back and help coach. You know, I went back and helped Booker T in 08 uh, coach football. I coached a football team. They hadn't won a state championship since I left in 84. So I go back and I talk to the coach at the time, who was a guy named uh, Coach Antoine Jimerson. Yeah, yeah. And he and he and he told me, he said, Melvin, you know, we can't, I can't win with these guys. I said, Coach, this is Booker T. I said, How can you not win with these guys? I said, I'll make a deal with you. You let me help you coach this year, and I show you how to win a championship. And I coached that year. We won a championship, and I didn't coach anymore. <laughs> I didn't go back. I was done. <laughs> it's a good time to go out on, on a winning note, that is for sure. You know, but I always thought, especially when you were here, I thought, you know, this guy here has got, I mean, he's got the appeal, he's got the knowledge, he, you know, he can relate and all those things. Now, I guess you've got to do the same kind of stuff in banking because you deal True. with different people. But, uh, you know, I, again, I, 
here I am trying to chart your career, but I always thought you, <laughs> I always thought you'd be on a sideline somewhere doing it. Well, I, I'll tell you, that was my edge, Tom, when I was at Oklahoma State. My edge was I had to outthink my guys because I wasn't the biggest. I wasn't the fastest. So I had to be the smartest, and I had to be the most in shape. I could run all day, and I could study film. I could be intelligent. There was no guy that could outwork me in the film room or on the field, and that was my edge. So, I mean, I could watch a team line up. And I can call out the play they're getting ready to run by the set they're in because I don't study so much film. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was my edge. That was my edge all the time. I mean, I tell people all the time, a lot of people don't realize it, that after all this time, I'm still tied for second all time in interceptions in Oklahoma State. What did you have? And you my, had like 10 in, in the last two years, didn't you? Something like exactly. that? Exactly. Yeah. And, and, and they – and if I'd have played, if I if they'd have let me play safety, I'd have blew the record away. But I had I played safety one year, my junior year, and I was leading the nation in interceptions after the first three games. And they moved me back to corner. I only got only got a couple of more interceptions the whole year because nobody would throw my side. Mm -hmm. But you know, I said if I'd have got to play safety, I'd have blew the record away. And think back then they only threw the ball about. 25, 30 times a game. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Now they're throwing it 50 and 60 times a game. I don't understand how these kids can't beat this record. <laughs> have, would you have liked you know? to – this sounds like an old man question, but would you have liked to have played in today's style of oh, football? Oh, man. Oh, my God. I think I would have loved it because it was geared toward me. My deal was cover. Yeah. So now if you can cover, you can go make a gazillion dollars. Yeah. I'm watching guys that can't cover make a gazillion dollars. So when I played, you had to come up and make tackles too. Yeah, yeah. And they don't do that anymore. Now you do that throwing the ball 60, 65 times a game. A whole game when we played, Tom, was 65 plays. A whole game. Now games, there are 120, 130 plays in a game now. Do you, you know, I was looking at some of the rosters, uh, and it goes without saying. I mean, you, and you'd be the first to, to give credit to your teammates, but I'm telling you, you play with some of the iconic football players at Oklahoma State when you were here. Uh, and oh, my God. Not to mention the guy who's heading the, heading the show up right now in Gundy. Exactly. I was, me and Barry were talking last week. We talked for about an hour last week, me and Barry said. And I said, Barry, let me tell you what was overwhelming for me. They come to – pro scouts come and talk to us. Guys come talk to us, and they say, okay, guys, here are the odds. Out of this team, there's probably only going to be three of you that make it to the NFL. And I look around. I'm on a team with Barry Sanders, Thurman Thomas, Leslie O'Neill, Mark Moore, John Washington, and they said only two or three. I'm like, hell, I'm nowhere in there. <laughs> so, so I better get a degree. <laughs> I said, man, that was just that was just mind-boggling that I got to play. And out of those guys, two of them are Hall of Famers. Yeah, they were yeah. on the same team. You got to pitch yourself every once in a while to, to think, you know, I was. When you're going through it, you're not. This is not registering, but. You know, it, it did to me, and I forgot some of the people you actually played with. I went down to roster, uh, guys I hadn't heard from in a while. But, you know, Dykes, you played with him as last oh, yeah. year. Yeah, uh, you had Dykes, you had Gundy. I mean, you had Cadillac, the wide receiver. I mean, Gerald Hudson. I mean, we had a team where guys were going pro every year. Joe King. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, there was loads of talent on that team, on our team. And, uh, I mean, it was unbelievable. I, I do a celebrity golf tournament every year. I, I'm doing it. It's coming up this weekend. And I have a lot of OSU guys, OU guys, Nebraska guys come in for my celebrity golf tournament. Mike Rozier. Um, I have Mark Moore. I have Joe King. I have a lot of OSU guys come in. Uh, Marcus Dupree, Joe Washington. I mean, I have all these guys come in my celebrity golf tournament. This is about my 16th year doing it. And, and we do it every year, and we do it for Children's Hospital in Tulsa. Where do you hold so, it? Uh, Where do you hold it? We hold it at the Oaks Country Club. Okay. Yeah, 
the our, our host hotel is River Spirit uh, Hotel and Casino. They house us, and uh, we go play at the Oaks Country Club, and it, it's just a great event. It's the guys have such a good time, Tom, that they call me and say, "Hey, put me down for next year, so I can make sure I come." So put me down. I'm in. I mean, I don't even have to call the guys anymore. They call me and say, "Hey, I'm in. Just make sure you remind me so I can be there." Is it a I good mean, fundraiser? Great. Do you guys do? Oh, great fundraiser. We raise great money, man. We do great. We raise great money for for Children's Hospital. Uh, we usually do a, a different nonprofit, but. If you have never seen a bunch of grown men cry, because what we do is we sign a bunch of footballs and we walk, we split up and go to different floors and we take footballs to the kids that are in the hospital. And we take pictures with them. And it's sad because some of these kids will never leave that hospital. Mm -hmm. They're not going to make it out. And I'm watching these grown men, these big old rough, tough football players go in these rooms with these little kids and come out with a face full of tears. It's, 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 it's unbelievably rewarding for these guys. And I think that's why they, I mean, I've had George Rogers, Eric Dickerson. I've had one year, I had so many Heisman Trophy winners that the Heisman Trophy Association called me and said, what are you doing with our guys? Mm. <laughs> and I said, hell, I just asked them if they want to come play some golf and raise money for a nonprofit, and they show up. I mean, Gino Toretta. I've had little, I mean, literally everyone. Well, it's a, um, it's a great, great uh, job that you're doing, and, and certainly uh, the, the hospital, I'm sure, uh, appreciates each and every dollar that, that, that is raised. Now, I want to go back to uh, your time here. And, yeah. you know, when, when, people, when I throw your name out, I think most people remember he was a great football player, which you were. I mean, all-conference player and uh, – uh, as we talked about the interceptions and all that. Uh, but they forget the time you spent on the basketball court. Uh, and, sure. and I like the comment you said, Coach Harris, said, why not play both? Was that going to be in the plans? That, uh, and when you came over here, did you make those intentions known? Yes, sir. I talked to Coach Jones about it, and Coach Jones didn't like it. <laughs> yeah. He said, he told me, he said, now, Melvin, if you're not going to get to play, and you're just going to be on the bench watching, you need to come because I would miss spring practice cause of basketball right so um he said now if you're going to be doing that and not getting to play you need to go on and let that alone and come play football because as you know i was on football scholarship i was considered a walk-on in basketball that's correct yes so um i said well coach jones i'm going to play i said not only am i going to play i'm going to start and coach jones doing how he does you know how he <laughs> puts his head down and looks over his glasses and says, well, 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 okay, Melvin, now if you're not going to play, now you just come on back over here. I said, all right, Coach Jones. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds just like that right there. That's good. Yeah, that's my guy. So, yeah, and I ended up starting my freshman year, and I was the first freshman to start in two sports in Big 8 history. So that was that was pretty cool. How did they and like you? Of- how did the coach well, – what kind of receptions did you get? Now, I, I know the answer to this because I was there. So – yeah, I'm asking Coach you a Hanson, question. I Coach know the Hanson question. And the players, yeah. the players were great. You know, one of the guys on the team was Nolan Richardson Jr., who I played with in high school. Yeah, yeah. Another guy was Ray Alford, who I played AAU basketball with. Another guy was Rashawn Patton, who I played AAU basketball with. So a lot of the guys I had played with already, so they knew me, and uh, they welcomed me. And Coach Paul Hanson was the best. When I tell you, he was the best. He was the best. He would tell the team, the guy who practices the best and practices the hardest, those are the guys I'm going to start. And I'm like, man, you can't ask for better than that. All I got to do is come work hard. And that's how I ended up getting the start because I practiced so hard and practiced so well that I ended up getting the start. And that's what it was. When I, it wasn't like that when I played for Coach Hamilton. <laughs> it was a little different. <laughs> yeah, a little different approach right there. Yeah. Totally different approach than that. How difficult but, uh, was you? We, we've had a handful of two sports uh, standouts, you know, Josh Fields being one that we've had on here. And mm-hmm. the, the, the public, the, the people, they don't see the grind and how difficult it is, especially when they're going on simultaneously. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, I'll you tell got, you that, it had to be tough, tough to do that. Oh, man, it was difficult, man. And then not only that, you still got to go to class. You still got to stay eligible because you got to understand – 
second semester is basketball, but you got to make sure you're eligible for football for next semester. Yeah. So going, you know, the hardest part was the academics, but it wasn't tough for me because I was a, I was a son of a public school teacher. So getting a degree, making grades was not an option. It was demanded. So there's no way I was going to make Miss Gillum upset with me. So making grades was understood. But I'll tell you, on the road, I had tutors. I was doing homework. I was lucky enough to really work. I had teachers that worked with me because normally when you had a test, you had to take your test early before you go. Yeah. So I, they would work with me and let me take my tests early and and make sure I would steal. I mean, it was, it was really a group effort from from the professors, from the tutors, and from the coaches because they realized how tough it was, too. And uh, they really worked with me all the way. And I was, I was lucky that they could because those are things they didn't have to do. Always tough questions here, uh, and in the time we got remaining, I'm going to kind of hit you, scatter shoot it a little bit here. But okay, uh, the, the the one football game that stands out in your mind, win or lose, and let's mm-hmm. carry it over to basketball as well. Okay, well, the one game that really stood out was the first game I got to play in as a freshman. Really, a lot of people would have thought I would have said the OU game where the the phantom call that we lost in the end. We've had a few of those in that series. Yeah. But I think it was the first game I got to play because I come in as this – Hartley and I came in as highly touted recruits. We were top recruits in the country. He was number one recruit out of Texas. I was number one recruit out of Oklahoma. So we were expecting to play. And the first game I didn't get to play, and I was upset. I'm like, man, what is going on? Why am I not getting to play? So the second game, Mark Moore – goes in and hits a guy and knocks himself out. So I get to go in. The very first series, I got an interception. Came out. The next series, I went back in and got a big hit. The next, From then on, I started the rest of the year. <laughs> so that's the game that really stood out to me the most, really proving that I was worthy of being on the field. And I had to literally go out and prove it because Coach Campbell really didn't like playing freshman. Yeah, yeah. Lewis Campbell, that's a, that's a name out of yep. the past right there. Yep. What about basketball? Basketball was, I got to say, the OU game my freshman year because we were playing OU in Stillwater. And I think, man, they were ranked pretty good. They had uh, Anthony Bowie, Ricky Grace. They had those guys, Mookie Blaylock, mm-hmm. all these guys. And uh, I had a great game. I first started with Ricky Grace, and I went through him. I was just scoring like crazy. Then they took Ricky Grace off me, and they put uh, McAllister on yeah. me. And mm-hmm. he was supposed to be their best defensive player. And I went through him. Then they put Anthony Bowie on me. And as you know, Anthony Bowie is from Tulsa. Right. And I'm from Tulsa, so I grew up playing with Anthony Bowie my whole life. So Anthony Bowie comes over to stick me, and I said, Anthony, you know you cannot stick me. Why did they bring you over here? And that's the funniest thing. I remember that game, and we ended up beating the OU that year. And the whole stands rushed the floor. Yeah, and yeah. I remember Thurman Thomas and them coming out there and picking me up. <laughs> and that was great. That was unbelievable. Hey, you're a straight shooter, and I know we, we talk about this seemingly every show on this station here, but you observe this now from your banking position. Uh, mm-hmm. What is your feeling about kids in this transfer portal that when things get tough or they need they think they need to move on, now they've got the avenue with which to do that? What do you think of that? Yeah, I think it's a bad deal, man, because it's, it's, it's teaching no commitment, and that's a bad thing to have in life. You know, I think that's a bad thing to really teach. Do I think something should be done? Yes, because a coach can leave and take another job, and nothing can happen to that coach because he's going to get a better job. I mean, if, if the pros call for Mike Gundy to leave or another college that he thought was better, he could leave and nothing could happen. 
and a player can leave and he have to sit out a year. But I think there has to be some type of deterrent put in place where a kid just can't leave when things get tough. I mean, I mean, I think I like to sit out a year. I like that. You let the kid go, but he's going to have to lose something. Yeah. Now, now I got to teach some, some type of ownership. I got to teach, you know, your decision makes sense. And I just think that just letting them leave and letting them go. I just think it's setting a poor example for life. What's going to happen when you go get that job and it's going to get tough. What are you going to do? Quit and go get another job. Because that job is going to get tough, too. Because I'm sorry, that's just life, and that's the way it is. But I just think, I just think, really, I wish that, you know, I talk to kids all the time, and I really push responsibility. And I push, I need y'all to understand, life is not fair, and it's not going to be fair. But you got to learn how to make lemonades out of lemons. I said, the best thing you can do in life, guys, if you don't hear anything I say, is, you have to learn how to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. If you can do that, you'll be fine. Do you ever think you're going into motivational speaking? Or, I mean, <laughs> golly. <laughs> I don't know, man. I've been around a lot of good speakers from Coach Jones to Coach Hanson to Coach Harris. I've been around some good guys. Where so, is – real- where was all this when we were doing interviews before and after each game for basketball and football? I, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't hear this this gregarious Melvin Gillum at that time. Well, hopefully, man, as you get older, you learn some things. Barry Sanders told me that. Barry Sanders said, "Melvin, you not like you were in college." I said, "Barry, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> I hope not, man. I hope I've grown. I hope I've learned. I hope." I'm hoping I've gotten a little better than what I was in college. Somebody asked me a while back when we had you on maybe or about you and, you know, what kind of an interview was he? And I said, well, you know, maybe he didn't say much because I didn't ask good questions. I don't Maybe that was the problem. But I said, Gillum and I always had a good relationship, but he was, oh. he was just, uh, you know, if he could say it in six words, he'd say it in four, you know, and, and yeah. get, get the point across. Now you say it in well, 86 words. Well, I really try. I really try. You know, at that time, I was really big on team, Tom. You know how I was. Yeah, yeah. I would always give my guys credit. You know, it's easy to be great being around great guys. You know, and we got great guys. And I always wanted to push team because I knew how important that was. And and now, it's not so much team, and I can really tell you, tell you, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's more like the Gillum I know right there. That, there that you com- go. That there comment go. right there. Hey, I always appreciate you coming on. We have a good time. We had a good time when you I were here, it. and I we love it, we man. see you from time to time when you come back, yeah. and you do come back a lot. But uh, uh, we'll get over there. I got you know we, when I come over to Tulsa next, I got your number. I'll call, I'll call your Please second do. cell phone. Your second I'll cell phone. I'll tell you phone. what. Lunch on me, buddy. You know what? Lunch Everybody heard that. Everybody heard that. Yeah. Mr. Banker. I got you. Mr. That's Banker. Right. I got you. You probably Lunch write it me. off as a business expense. Try to get... <laughs> we'll figure it out. You, I, <laughs> we'll figure it let out. me tell you, I, I know you'll figure something out right there. <laughs> hey, listen, I appreciate you joining us, man. Great great to visit with you, and we'll stay in touch. Will do. Anything for you, Tom. All right, buddy. Thank you. All right. All right. That's Melvin Gillum, one of the best players, two-way players we've ever had here, and a, a straight shooter and a guy that uh, – uh, we had a work hard to get, I mean, because a lot of people wanted him. And you know what? Maybe the best thing he ever had coming out of high school, he was a National Football Foundation Scholar Athlete of the Year. Scholar Athlete of the Year. And I think he credits his mom, who was a school teacher, making sure that he put it all in perspective, that is for sure.